Okay, welcome everybody. Um, someone stole my gavel. I hope that's not a message for me and Ursula. I didn't take it. You didn't take it? Okay. I thought you had it in your, your, your plane to go to Poland with it or something. <laughs> Listen, um, again, seriously welcome. Since we met, since we, since we last met in September, uh, the, the team's work has continued on a lot of fronts and it will be reflected in a record number of letters that we will discuss later today. Uh, so we do have a lot to cover. Uh, the president uh, is expected to join us within the hour or so. I'm looking at Valerie. But, or so, yeah, the or so part was emphasized. We've dealt with this before. We can do it. So the strategy is going to be just plow ahead. And when he walks in, we just stop and pretend as if we've been waiting for him for the last hour. <laughs> we, uh, uh, we engage, and, and for those of you that are new, we will, you will have no trouble engaging with our president on issues that are of importance to us. He expects it and asks for it. Uh, so why don't we just jump into it? Ursula, do you have any comments? Um, just some quick ones. Yep. Uh, I think this meeting is, is as, as most of them are, timely. Um, the administration is, is actually making significant progress, I call it firing on all cylinders, on the trade agenda and in the past year. It's, mm. it's really great to see. Yeah. Uh, Secretary Pritzker has been an amazing partner, and, and the Commerce in general has been an amazing partner. And I welcome and we welcome the NEI Next um, initiative that I think the Secretary will talk a little bit about. Um, we think it is time for us to redouble our efforts since um, we have, and adjust our strategy since we probably will miss our doubling exports by 2014 goal, but that should not deter us too much from pushing hard um, to the next level. We have a lot of barriers that, that the commerce knows about. Um, my industry in particular, um, we're facing a barrage of proposals to block cost broader um, information flows and data, and data flows, and this is, I think, the new, a uh, new area that um, Commerce is helping us on and making sure that we make progress. And I think that Ginny uh, Rometty of IBM will cover that uh, a little bit later. On the government side, we need to continue to fight um, all of the natural and um, unnatural resistance to opening borders to trade, um, and just keep pushing. So I, I am, I am pleased um, with the progress that we've made so far really pleased with the partnership that we have with the, with the Commerce Department and the USTR and, and you know, all of the agencies to help us push. So thank you so much for the work. Okay, thank you, Ursula. And, and before turning over to the, to the Secretary, I, I'd just like to offer uh, a comment. Uh, Loretta, where are you? Loretta, uh, lo for those of you that aren't aware, Loretta Smitzer, this is the third PEC she's staffed over the last 20 years, okay? In this incarnation, supporting me uh, uh, from from a Boeing organizational perspective, but she was also part of Commerce, Commerce Department for staffing one of the PECs, and and uh, so 20 years of PECs, and she's retiring. So I just wanted to recognize Loretta's efforts. <laughs> we we will miss you, Loretta. Valerie, do you have a, a couple of comments? Uh, thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, of course, I want to begin, as always, by thanking both Jim and Ursula for their leadership of this extraordinary board. Many of you have been here since the beginning, and so I think you'd agree with me that this has been uh, productive and constructive and a good example of the private-public partnership uh, that is so important. Uh, in this year's State of the Union, the President said this is going to be a year of action, and it has certainly been. And the actions that we have taken have been informed by the advice and counsel that we've received from so many of you. I do want to mention there are a couple of uh, new folks to the table since our last meeting. Uh, the President's Cabinet Secretary, Broderick Johnson, down at the end, Broderick Way, so everybody says hello to you, uh, who helps coordinate all of uh, the Cabinet's um, functions through the White House. And also our new Administrator for SBA, Maria Contreras Sweet. Maria, wave to the crowd. And uh, not new to the table, but in a new capacity, Jeff Sines, who you all know is now the President's Director of the um, Council on Economic Advisors, right? 
National, I, I knew I got Close it wrong. I was, as enough. soon as I said it, I said, that sounds an awful lot like <laughs> no, Jason's, <laughs> that sounds like Jason's title. Uh, the NEC, National Economic Council, and you're gonna be hearing from him shortly. So my message is simply that there is this strong alignment of interests, and uh, as the president focuses on how to grow the economy, exports and trade are an integral part of that agenda. And so the work that um, you have done throughout his administration, our agenda today, reflects that priorities. And so I just want to really thank you for your service and your willingness to, uh, with everyone having such a busy agenda, do what you do. And we couldn't really do it, what we do, without the leadership from uh, the Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker, who has not hit, not just hit the ground, but hit the skies, hit every mode of transportation running since she's been here. So thank you, Jim, for a chance to say a few words. Thank you, thank you, Valerie. And, and, and the White House engagement uh, and cabinet level engagement, uh, Loretta informs me, has never been stronger, ever been stronger than it has during this PEC era. So we thank you for that engagement and appreciate it. And it, it enables the effectiveness of the work of this group to be magnified. Uh, uh, much more than it would be otherwise. So, sorry, but Penny, Terrific. my partner in crime. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, uh, Jim, and thank you, Ursula, for all of your great work. And to all the members of the PEC, we really appreciate your leadership and your advice. The letters that you put together, as always, are extremely Welcome. valuable to us. Um, I'll just say one thing before I kind of get into talking about NEI next, which is this is a team effort. And, uh, you know, I've been here now almost a year, and one of the things people ask me what surprises me about being in the public sector, and I would say what's extraordinary to me is the team effort. And the PEC members saw it earlier today when Ambassador Froman and I and Ambassador Rice sat and, you know, spoke with you about uh, some of the things going on around the world. And what you need to know is that the folks in the White House, the folks at USTR, Commerce, you know, whether it's transportation or XM, OPIC, you know, we're, we're all working together to try on your, you know, grow the economy. Uh, and Jeff is a great leader of our interagency processes, uh, as is Ambassador Rice. So I, I think that's hopefully you come away from your visits here with a message of, you know, we may not always agree on every fine point, but we're do we really do have, are trying very hard to get to the best answers, taking into account all the facts. And the, as I think, uh, uh, Jim, you said, these are unbelievably complicated challenges we deal with at certain times. So let me talk a little bit about exports. Um, from the start of President Obama's time in office, this administration has been focused on increasing exports. It's been a central pillar of the strategy for economic growth, and for a good reason. We know that more exports means more good jobs in the United States. We know that more exports means better business for our companies. And we know that it means that uh, all of you and our other businesses throughout the United States will be able to reach more customers if we do a good job supporting uh, exports. That led to uh, the creation of the National Export Initiative, which you all were very instrumental in creating with lots of principles behind it. Uh, and you've been critical in our achieving enormous success in our exports over the last four years. We've had four straight record years of exports. We have $2.3 trillion of exports. Uh, one third of our growth since 2009 has been driven by exports. Our manufacturing sector is growing and selling more Made in America products overseas. Nearly 30,000 businesses are exporting for the first time since the recession. More than 1.6 million Americans are earning paychecks thanks to the export supported jobs. So this is an extraordinarily important uh, pillar in our economic growth and American owned Companies are expanding facilities and adding new ones and bringing jobs to America and investing both here and abroad, and that is undergirding this growth. So taken together, these facts and figures paint a very clear picture and send a really clear message. There's no better time to invest or do business in the United States, but there's also no better time for American-located businesses to be exporting. Uh, 
And with these major gains, though, there's still a lot more work that we can be doing. And when the PEC met last September, uh, we discussed the need for better metrics. Uh, and that conversation inspired a full-scale assessment, which included focus groups in 11 cities, surveys that reached 6,000 customers and partners, uh, an evaluation of the impact of our trade missions, our trade shows, and our, pop our popular services, as well as an examination of what are the potential opportunities for us. And the findings were really instructive. Leaders at the Department of Commerce took this feedback very seriously and worked with our sister trade organizations to develop what we call NEI Next. Uh, and NEI Next is data focused and customer driven. It's, uh, it will help uh, ensure that more American businesses can fully capitalize on markets opening up across the globe. We have five strategies that undergird NEI Next. The first is that we'll help businesses find their next customer abroad. The second is that we'll increase the efficiency of a company's first and next shipment. Uh, third is we will help firms finance their next uh, order. Fourth is we will help communities integrate trade and investment into their next growth plans. And fifth is we will open the next big markets around the world for our companies while ensuring a level playing field. So importantly, under NEI Next, we're going to support the creation of data for three purposes, to help businesses make better decisions, uh, to better inform communities throughout the United States so they can better integrate trade and investment into their economic development strategies and to help us in the government gather feedback from customers, industry, and stakeholders to continuously improve our efforts. So NEI Next is going to be a driving force behind our work to help American businesses grow, export, and create jobs. Uh, NEI Next will continue to extend the reach of American innovation and ingenuity around the world. And NEI Next will enable and empower us to deliver our central message loud and clear, which is America is open for business. But to do this successfully, we can't do it without your guidance and help. And the feedback that you give us is invaluable uh, to not just those of us in leadership, but frankly to our teams. And for that, we were really, really grateful. And uh, we recognize, and I recognize having sat in the private sector and, and been part of these committees that provide advice, how much work goes into it. So I not only thank all of you who are on the PEC, but I really thank your staffs for the support work that they're doing, working with all of our staffs to make this happen. Uh, and thank you for your leadership in helping American companies compete throughout the world. Uh, thank you very much, Penny. I mean, I think uh, w we're with you. NEI next, uh, a lot of fresh ideas, new metrics, and I know a lot of the letters today that we're going to we're going to review our responsive to some of the things that are called for, so appreciate it very much. Another theme we've had is manufacturing innovation. And I think, <coughs> Jeff, were you going to make a, offer a couple of comments along the way? By the way, we, we've been giving uh, Penny some plaudits for her engagement with the business community, but this fellow here, Jeff Zients, has reached out about as fast as Penny has, so. Keep competing in that regard, would you, too? <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm we, fine being in It's, highly, place it's highly appreciated, Jeff. Well, yeah. Just yeah, two minutes. We're two partner. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I forgot. Two minute run here. Um, yeah. You know, for all the reasons that you all know so well, we do have the wind at our back for really manufacturing yeah. and exports, given the skill of our workforce, the productivity of our workforce, the um, fact that we are the world leader in innovation, and now this new comparative advantage in energy. Um, what I think, in addition to all of that and what we've been focused on uh, this week uh, and will continue to, to be focused on, is the level of entrepreneurship and innovation around manufacturing. In fact, if you look at the data, this is the high le highest level of entrepreneurial activity in the manufacturing sector uh, that we've seen in over 20 years. And this week, the President's really been highlighting that to um, call it out and, and hopefully add even more momentum to it. He went uh, earlier in the week to Pittsburgh to a tech shop to look at real-time uh, innovation and manufacturing. I know he really enjoyed that visit. Valerie was with him. Uh, yesterday, uh, we hosted here at the White House, the President hosted a Maker's Fair, the first ever Maker's Fair, 
and to the extent I could track what was going on, it was really cool. A lot of it was way over my head. Um, we also announced that the federal government would be opening up our spare capacity to entrepreneurs and makers. So when NASA has, you know, has state-of-the-art wind tunnels, if that can help makers test the aerodynamic uh, uh, facets of their products, that's now open uh, for their for their use. So we're um, that's about five billion dollars worth of advanced equipment, which will now be open to entrepreneurs. Um, we had 90 mayors uh, commit to the Maker Challenge, so they're now finding spare capacity in their libraries uh, and other government buildings to host makers and put in uh, place leading edge equipment, which as you, all of you know is becoming cheaper and cheaper. So I think that uh, we should be looking for the opportunity for these new companies to export right away and that uh, really can help with uh, NEI Next and help to grow the economy. I'm looking forward to our conversation on XM. Uh, in that I do think it's a timely uh, matter, and I know Fred uh, and Robert are going to talk more about it, but I think it is time for us to be focused on XM reauthorization. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate the, uh, the plug on XM. I think we're going to hear from Fred, maybe uh, a similar theme later. My only comment on the list of technologies you're, you're supporting, just go easy on the wind tunnels. Okay, just sort of, <laughs> we got that, Marilyn and I got that covered. <laughs> uh, Secretary Kerry has, has joined us. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. Um, we're not sure what your timing is, Mr. Secretary. Um, we could offer you a minute now to make some remarks, or we could uh, wait, a, wait another half hour or so after reviewing the letters. Which, which would you uh, prefer? Let's review the letters and uh, what I figure out what everybody's talking about. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to figure out where I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the busiest man in the world, right here to my right. So, look, why don't we turn to the letters and let's move through these uh, expeditiously, but with the proper process. Um, I think uh, our first letter is uh, underlining the importance of uh, Trade Promotion Authority, and I think Ken, Ken Fraser, were you gonna were you gonna summarize for us? Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you, Jim. Building on the work of the PEC over the last several years, this letter on Trade Promotion Authority underscores the role of TPA to advance tangible progress <coughs> on trade. As we all know, TPA is a critical piece of the trade framework, namely establishing congressional objectives for what the administration will deliver in high standard and comprehensive trade agreements. Given the changes in the global economy over the last few years and the important trade negotiations currently underway, it's timely to update our goals since TPA was last passed in 2002. We also must update TPA to reflect changes in U.S. law, for example, that are relevant to intellectual property, which is a cornerstone of our economy. TPA is crucial to ensure that we pursue trade agreements that reflect both our values as well as the opportunities in the current and future global economy. TPA is Congress's opportunity to set goals and expectations not just on substance but on process. TPA ensures that Congress's voice is heard and that there are mechanisms in place to share information and to seek guidance from legislators throughout the negotiations. For all these reasons, we urge the administration to continue its engagement with Congress and to seek passage of TPA as soon as possible. We remember Ambassador Froman's comments earlier this morning about what's the cart and what's the horse in terms of substantive agreements like TPP versus TPA, but we underscore the importance of TPA. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ken. And I think the, the other side of the coin, obviously, even though we're calling on the administration to continue the emphasis is our engagement. And I know Mike will probably remind us of that uh, later when he makes his remar remarks, but a big part of the TPA equation is us continuing to weigh in, continuing to make it a priority as we, as we work the Hill and, and uh, meet, with, uh, meet with friends and supporters. So that's, we don't mean to uh, ignore that responsibility as we call for more effort from all of you. Is there any other discussion, or are we pretty much singing to a common choir here? I, th I think we are. So uh, with no objections, uh, and I don't see any, the letter is adopted. Uh, second letter, Ginny, and you warmed up earlier today over breakfast on cross-border data flows.
but why don't you give us uh, a, a summary of the second letter on cross state of border flows? Okay. Well, in, in first, I should say that the administration has taken a number of actions already in this area. It's both cross data flows, cross border data flows, as well as data localization. And in fact, um, these are a threat not only to operation globally, but also to business globally. And frankly, it's a threat to how governments can even operate and the benefits they get. So. The past two years, um, both Secretary Pritzker and Ambassador Froman have both been very helpful in their attempts and their efforts here because we have seen some successful rollback of troubling policies. I think many people are well aware of the uh, India preferential market access policy that got pulled back. Um, but since, and, and quite clearly, since the Snowden revelations, what has happened is you see an increase now in governments who are advocating and promoting local and digital protectionism. Um, just to list some of the countries, Brazil, Turkey, Russia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Nigeria, India, um, and they're in the forms of cross-border or the data protection or keeping data local. And honestly, there are many times often a condition to do business there. So while privacy and security, those are often the reasons stated for this, uh, outright stated, this is really a form of protectionism, and it is really uh, often driven by local competition, local commercial competition. Um, I don't think anyone would argue that you need data. It's a lifeblood of an economy. It's for our governments. It's for our businesses, for small, medium enterprises as well to succeed around the world. And while privacy and security are essential, it's just really important that we believe that any local requirements for this, it will actually just create trade barriers and do nothing for privacy and security yeah, at yeah. the end of the day. So we would uh, advocate that we really work together to defeat any of this digital protectionism. And in the short term, please continue the administration to do what we've been doing is as these creep up, we go work on them bilaterally. But as we spoke about earlier today with Ambassador Froman, um, the most important thing is to intensify the focus on all the trade agreements to be sure that they actually, uh, that there are rules there that uh, that prohibit that and protect that we're able to move data and not mm -hmm. have to store data locally. And I just end on the point that this isn't about a technology industry issue. This is every company's issue. It's every company, every industry, and frankly, all governments as well, and their ability to both create economic prosperity and move jobs. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 taken to an extreme, it would impair our ability to conduct business globally. Yep. And so threading this needle between being sensitive to local sensitivities on privacy on one hand, but not allowing agreements to wrap local interests to wrap themselves in that cloak yep. to, in essence, produce a protectionist environment is what I think is, is the point. So, and I know, I know Ursula and you, Ginny, have felt very strongly that we've crafted this letter. So is there any other discussion on, on Ginny's uh, proposal? Without, without objection, then, we will adopt the second letter. And uh, our third letter is on innovation policy. I believe Ian Reid is uh, of Pfizer. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, look forward to hearing a summary. Thank you. Uh, well, look, the, um, the letter recommends a comprehensive national innovation and competitiveness policy. I think the United States has become accustomed to thinking of itself as a leader in innovation and the strongest country in the world. But the reality is that, that we no longer hold a, com a commanding edge. We are still ahead, but it's being eroded rapidly by competitors. Other nations, particularly in Asia, are using national policies with a comprehensive approach uh, to innovation, to attract research and development investments, and to promote innovation that's threatening America's competitive edge. And they are succeeding. Some examples are in, our, in the biomedical sector. India, China, South Korea, Taiwan have implemented aggressive national strategies. This has fueled a rise of 15.1 billion in biomedical investment in Asia from 2007 through 2012. And this is at the direct expense of investments in the US. In uh, 2000, Singapore launched a biomedical scientific initiative to develop Singapore economic competitiveness and establish the country as a center of biomedical excellence. Uh, they've created an investment climate that includes financial and tax incentives, infrastructure improvements, strong IP, regulatory frameworks, and talent retention. They've managed to, in a decade, double the employment and R&D, and they now have increased their pharmaceutical exports by 500% to just over $6 billion. China launched a similar innovation platform under which research expenditures have grown by over 300% in the period between 7 and 12, 
And at this rate, China's funding of R&D is expected to surpass that of the U.S. by 2022. Mm. So China is, ch is, is churning out hundreds of thousands of life science graduates every year and increasing their ability to be competitive. So I believe we should identify innovation as a national priority and just not narrowly looking at it by saying increasing funding for STEM uh, education or creating a more robust R&D credit. We should push for a comprehensive uh, multifaceted policy framework that includes long-term investment and policy changes to support innovation. Such a policy which support collaboration between governments, academia and industry in every sector that benefits from innovation. It would help retain talent in the U.S., restore funding to basic research, uh, ex expansion of education in STEM, and it would drive reforms in national tax, intellectual policy, and civil justice systems to create a more favorable environment. Now, I, I think it's time for the United States to step back, and just like it's looked at having a national energy policy, it needs to step back and have a, nat a, a national innovation and competitive policy to ensure that the United States continues to grow and prosper from the abilities we have here. Thank you. A, a very timely uh, reminder and recommendation. Um, I, think it, I think this is one of these where uh, going down a list of specific actions is difficult at this stage, but it needs to get on the national agenda. And I think that's the spirit of Ian's, Ian's comments. And, uh, we think it can make a big difference uh, in the medium and long term in particular. And we're beginning to eat our own seed corn inadvertently right now as, as, uh, as an economy. So we wanted to raise the issue, and, and uh, there'll be more discussion and debate over time. I know Jeff and the President have been focused heavily in this area, and we'd Penny, do you have do you have a comment there? Just sure. Make a quick comment. So one of the four pillars of the Department of Commerce's strategy is around innovation. One is focused on manufacturing, and I just want to put a plug in for the National Network of Manufacturing okay. Innovation, uh, and something which is having great success. We have four institutes that exist today. There is bipartisan and bicameral support for legislation. And I think it's an incredible return on the taxpayer's dollar investment. So I just, as one avenue, we've also put together, working with Jeff, uh, sort of a uh, uh, list of the things that are going on around innovation in this administration. Maybe we could bring back to you That'd what we're doing. Uh, we at Commerce took a, a, an inventory and then we could talk about areas where you think we ought to be focused. Super. That's, that's the kind of engagement we're looking for. That's, that's fantastic. And, and these four manufacturing innovation centers around the country, we're, a number of us around the room are participating. And uh, I'm looking at Pat and myself in Chicago, for example. And uh, these, these show some promise. And uh, so those examples and others, let's, let's take a look at them. And, Let's see if they, uh, how they measure up to Ian's call Excellent. and see if there's more we should be doing. So thank you very much, uh, Ian. Appreciate it. So again, without objection, very compliant group here today. Good. <laughs> we will accept the letter. Uh, trade facilitation. I think, Scott, were you going to, Scott Davis of UPS? Scott, by the way, is, uh, is calling his own number at UPS. That's an, inc an increasingly rare <laughs> event yeah. in, in U.S. Uh, corporate life. Do what you can. Transitioning <laughs> to the exalted non-executive chairman status. We all wish for that. You, know? <laughs> you don't do anything, but you second guess everything. Perfect. I'm just the right person for that. But thanks for your service. Thanks for your service to this council thanks, over, the, over the years. So, thanks, Jim. Yeah. Well, last December, the 159 World Trade Organization member countries completed the negotiations on the agreement on trade facilitation. I think a lot of people said that would never happen. So congratulations, Ambassador Perlman and your team. That was a fantastic job that they've done. The letter highlights the importance of the agreement, urges the administration to take a leading role in ensuring its ratification and imp implementation by WTO member states, and underscores the importance of private sector input during the process. Trade facilitation reforms help boost trade by reducing costs and delays at the border through measures that provide predictability 
simplicity and uniform, uniformity in customs and other border procedures. A 2013 report published by the World Economic Forum estimated that even partial trade facilitation improvements could increase global GDP over six times more than removing all tariffs around the world. Small and medium-sized enterprises that do not have the resources to navigate complex webs of customs and border procedures will especially benefit from trade facilitation reform. The WTO agreement includes commitments to expedite movements, release and clearance of goods, and improve cooperation among WTO members on customs. While the ATF is not a panacea that addresses every supply chain barrier around the world, the agreement does include many important provisions that can reduce time, cost, and complexity at the border. While negotiations on the agreement have been completed, the ATF's multi-year implementation process has only just begun. In this recommendation, the PEC urges your administration to play a leading role in not only implementing the agreement domestically, but also encouraging other WTO members to ratify and implement the agreement. Furthermore, during this implementation process, the PEC encourages the administration to create a systematic process for private sector input. The administration has already begun to engage the business community regarding ATF implementation. This initial outreach, however, should be enhanced through the creation of a formalized structure for private sector engagement. American companies that trade with the world, that build and operate global supply chains, and that partner with firms of all sizes in every country can offer frontline visibility into current customs capabilities and the progress with implementation. And finally, the PEC appreciates the administration's efforts to conclude the ATF and looks forward to partnering on effective implementation going forward. Thanks very much, Scott. I think uh, this is one we've been working for a while. I know Commerce and others have been engaged. Pat, I know you've been heavily engaged. Uh, any comments? Uh, this, this gets as close to an article of faith as we get in this, in this kind of meeting. So without objection, we'll approve the letter. Thank you. And thanks again for your service. Sure. Appreciate it. I think Arnie, uh, Arnie Sorensen, uh, Travel and Tourism. Where's Arnie? Right here. S s there, there he is. Would you please propose the letter? Yes. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the Services Subcommittee of the PEC, I'm happy to present this letter, which is really seeking to build on the great momentum that's already underway in uh, tr travel and tourism. Uh, there is a global competition underway to uh, grab as many of the hundreds of millions of new travelers around the world. Uh, these are folks who, by and large, are entering the middle class for the first time, uh, who have the resources to get beyond simply caring for housing and health and food and nourishment, uh, and they're looking to travel. Uh, and uh, the, the competition really involves, from the U.S. perspective, uh, three things. Uh, we are obviously a well-known destination. We've got great things to offer. But the first is communicating an invitation uh, that we'd like for folks to come and leave their dollars here. That's where the exports come from. Uh, the second is to uh, ease the process of permission uh, to allow them to come here. And the third, of course, is to focus on the arrival experience. Uh, great progress has been made through the leadership of President Obama and many members of the administration, as well as great uh, leaders on the Hill. Uh, and there is great momentum. Uh, Brand USA was formed a couple of years ago. It now needs reauthorization. That is the vehicle which communicates the invitation uh, to folks to come to the United States. Uh, studies have been done. Uh, not a single public dollar is spent in uh, communicating that welcome. Uh, but the dollars that are spent, which are a portion of the visa application fees, uh, are driving roughly 50 to 1 return. Uh, the second is permission. And that's really about issuing visas to foreigners to permit them to come to the United States. <laughs> Uh, with focus there, too, uh, wait times have come down significantly uh, from about 90 days to four or five days in places like China. Uh, but there's further work to be done there around uh, easing renewal of visas, extending the length of visas, uh, and over time using uh, technology to ease the visa uh, interview process. Uh, and then finally, it's arrival. Uh, what, do, what do these foreign travelers see when they come to the United States? How long are the lines? Are the, uh, is the arrival process filled with smiles and welcome? Uh, and what do we do about the infrastructure? And almost everybody in this room uh, travels. 
you know the stark difference between the main terminal at LaGuardia and many of the new terminals that have been built around the world. That's just one example of the kind of infrastructure. Uh, so there are uh, specific near-term steps, reauthorization of Brand USA, authorization of the JOLT Act, uh, and then longer-term steps around uh, infrastructure investment and arrival. Uh, but we thank the, the administration and uh, the Hill for leadership so far and think more, much more can be done to grab uh, tens of millions of new visitors to the United States. You know, I think the, uh, uh, the work at the Department of Transportation, TSA, and State the have provided a lot of the mechanics that, uh, under the category of unsung activities. I, I happen to see a fair amount of it given the airplanes that facilitate a lot of this travel mechanically. And I, I highly appreciate the engagement of, uh, of state, TSA, and transportation. Did you have a comment, Secretary Fox, or is uh, your, your weighing in has been particularly important here? Uh, thank you, Jim and Ursula, for your leadership. And uh, we at DOT are very excited about the President's uh, announced goal of 100 million uh, international um, tourists to the U.S. by 2021. Uh, I would only add one point on the infrastructure issue, which is uh, we are experiencing a fair amount of congestion in our airways that can be a limiting factor on our ability to deliver on, uh, on our goals. And uh, there is technology that we are now deploying. We were actually in Houston yesterday um, uh, to make an announcement about a further development in next gen and our ability to create more capacity within the airspace. Uh, it's a very important uh, uh, technology that we are rolling out that essentially puts us out of the business of using World War II rad radar systems and into the business of using 21st century GPS um, to uh, shorten the distance between planes, creating more fuel efficiency, safer landings, uh, more efficient landings. It's going to save millions of gallons of gas and other things, but it's also going to create more capacity in the airspace. And so this is a very, very important piece of how we get to, uh, to the final goal. Here, here. <laughs> here, here. Yeah. Uh, Senator Klobuchar, did you have a comment? Yes, I did. Thank yeah. you, uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman and Vice Chair. I just wanted to commend uh, Arnie for his work. Uh, literally, uh, half of the export increase in the last year has been travel and tourism. It now counts yeah. for 22 percent, 22 percent of e export growth this year. And we're really proud of the work we've done with uh, Brand USA and the Export Promotion Act, the Travel Promotion Act. We have a reauthorization uh, that is going to the Commerce Committee very soon. Senator Blunt and I are leading it. We have 26 authors, half Democrats and half Republicans. We, we can't say that very often. Uh, so we are uh, very pleased with that because in the past there's been some controversy and I think the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, why we're feeling good about reauthorizing it either as part of the immigration bill in the Senate that it is part of or separately and we're, we're uh, having two tracks here to make sure we got it done. And I also wanted to add that I was just in Canada. Uh, Senator Blunt and I were up there last weekend and uh, led a trip there with five senators. And uh, there's uh, very much excitement there about what's going on with exports and uh, the possibilities of the more infrastructure at the border, not just for tourism, but also for uh, bringing in uh, more goods to market and really upping our game with Canada. And they were very positive about that. So I want to thank Arnie and uh, look forward to working with you on this in the future. Well, thank you for your leadership, Senator. I mean, you practice what you preach. I mean, you sent Jared Allen down to Chicago from Minnesota. It's a, it's a highly appreciated import in Chicago. Anytime. and and practicing what you're preaching on export. And we are Minnesota. getting the Super Bowl in 2018, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even though we were colder than Mars one well, day this year. You, so, you'll, yes. You've seen what bears away uniforms look like even in a Super Bowl. So, <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Senator, for your leadership there. And uh, without any other comments, uh, without objection, we'll, we'll Jim, let me do 30, do just 30 seconds on wait sure. times, because yes. visa wait times, as yep. Arnie said, come way down. <laughs> Got to keep working there. The next uh, challenge is wait times when people arrive, as Arnie said, at the airports. DHS is leading there, but it really is a city-by-city uh, -city partnership to get that done. You need the airport authorities and the local businesses to work with DHS. We've done it in Dallas-Fort Worth. We've done it in Chicago. We've had the wait times, but to do it at the top 15 airports, is, which is what the President has directed us all to do, it has to be a public-private partnership. So I would encourage people to work in their local cities to, to get this done.
Can I just say one more? Thank you. Yes. Just one more thing on that. To underscore what Jeff said, the president it did an executive order to direct Department of Commerce and the Department of Homeland Security to come up with a metric and to work towards a specific metric. And there, are, I can't remember if it's 120 days or it's a very fast time frame. But the other thing is Department of Homeland Security is looking for um, loaned executives to help them uh, with, uh, so that they can uh, uh, execute against these goals of doing um, what I call hospitality and national security all at the same time, or trade and national security at the same time. So any of you who might have folks that could be available to help them, I want to put a plug in for uh, DHS. They're being a great partner on this. Thank you. And we, I think we'll all try to respond to that. Pre you. Appreciate it, uh, Penny. Uh, so without objection and further comment, uh, we, we will adopt the letter. Uh, I've just been informed that, uh, uh, Valerie, I think the president is about 10, 15 minutes away, so we might be able to get through the letters. Our sixth letter will be presented by Vanessa Kaichez, uh, and it covers small business access to capital. Vanessa, I saw you earlier. There you are. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Thank it's good, you. It's Chair great to Jim. have you here. Thank yeah. you. Um, I was appointed last summer to represent the startup and small business community. And as we learned at the last meeting, only about 1% of small businesses in America export. So we want to try and increase that. So this letter is around access to capital. As we learned, um, American companies, small and entrepreneurial, are having issues of access to capital. Times have really changed where this industry used to be able to, or sector, go to <laughs> banks or community banks to get loans. And in fact, our company, over a two-year period, interviewed 30 community banks and was unable to get a loan. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we're really looking at solutions. What can we do to get to the gap of where we want to create jobs and innovation and then export? And therefore, a solution that community banks testified a couple years ago here is to go back and have states look at creative financing ideas as banks and community banks are unable to do so due to risk. Therefore, in Oregon, Governor Kitzhopper created what's called the Oregon Growth Board, where he actually took $100 million of lottery money, allocated it to over 10 venture capital firms, who then in turn invested in their sectors, in their small business and startups in their states and including Columbia Green is a bifactor of that type of creative financing, which then allowed us to grow, scale, and now export. Therefore, what we'd like to do here at PEC with regards to this access to capital is really urge the Department of Commerce to work with the National Governors Association, with the states, to look at putting more creative financing ideas around taking lottery money, pension funds, general funds, allocating those over to the venture capital to invest in each state's uh, sectors that are important to them. Oklahoma, yeah. uh, Colorado, Wisconsin are some of the other states that have done this type of creative financing. Therefore, again, on behalf of small business and startups, because the times have changed and banks and community banks can't get to this sector, we need to get them access to capital. We need to take action. We can do it through the states and the Department of Commerce the Conference of Mayors as well, and the SBA. And so we urge everyone to take action. And I know the National Governors Association is going to be bringing this up at their next agenda in their economic development story to begin sharing other stories like Oregon and Colorado and what we've done. Thank you. You know, uh, Vanessa, the most powerful argument for this letter is your experience and what you've done with Columbia Green. It's been spectacular. And Thank you. You don't know the story, but Google the story. <laughs> You'll love it. And, Thank you. Uh, and it's, uh, that example does as much for anything. Yes, do we, have, do we have any comments? I want to echo the points of the letter. I think access to capital is one of the biggest challenges that New York State businesses are facing still. Okay. Um, particularly for smaller businesses. And I really want to highlight and commend what Fred Hochberg's been doing through the Export-Import Bank because he took a tour with me through upstate New York to meet with small businesses. One business we met with was Mercer Dairy. They create ice cream that is made with wine, and apparently the Chinese love it. Um, but what, what Export can do for the small businesses is they can actually fill an order 
um, without receiving the money first. And that kind of insurance allows a small business like Mercer Dairy to say, okay, I can fill an order for all of this ice cream that I would never be able to afford to send without being paid first. Yeah. And it allows exactly. her to increase her exports. So one thing that was really important about that fly around is that most of our business had never heard of the, the, the programs under Export Import Bank that could actually help a small business. And so I think the more we amplify what the federal government can do through the SBA and through Export Import Bank, we will have more success stories. Um, I love the story Fred told about Granny's Pickles, some southern <laughs> grandmother who makes pickles. And again, the Chinese seem to love it. Um, so we're able to export our products worldwide. Um, the second thing is I, I want to focus on SBA's Challenge Her initiative. I think it's really important. Uh, one of the challenges that women-owned businesses have is they typically start their businesses with uh, eight times less capital than male-owned businesses. And it's not surprising because most of the avenues for capital are male-run. So most venture capitals are male-run, most private equity firms are male-run, most community banks and most large banks. And so as human nature dictates, we see brilliance in ourselves. And so if you don't have women who are running these funds, they don't always see the, business, the, the brilliance in the business idea for the women-owned businesses. It's just human nature. When banks do create targets for lending to women-owned businesses, they have found great results. And in Key Bank in upstate New York, it's a woman CEO. She said, I'm going to set a $3 billion target for women-owned business lending. She's exceeded that target. She's at $5 billion already, and it's among her highest performing portfolios. So when I meet with our bankers across the state, I urge them, please set a target. It doesn't matter what your target is, whatever is consistent with your own business model, just set one. Because you will see, even though these aren't the typical businesses you would normally fund, they actually make money. And they return. They are, they are not delinquent in their payments. They are very good returns on investment. So thank you for all the work you're doing. I think you're spot on in your focus. Because we know two thirds of all new jobs are created by small businesses. And without access to capital, they can't grow. And so with tools like Exim to help them facilitate exports, that's how we create growth, certainly in my state. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. Yeah. Did you want to make a comment? Yes. I did, yes. Yeah. Uh, lamentably, it's not the first time that I've heard a story similar to yours, mm -hmm. Vanessa, and so I understand. I came out of, I was California Secretary of Transportation, and as I was trying to dole out work to small businesses, I found that they had similar experiences. And so having arrived now as the new administrator of the SBA, and on day one, I set out to address some of those issues. So I'm just delighted to give you a little bit of, a, of an update. And that is that first and foremost, we've now put in a technology that we think is going to help expedite. It's the process through which we engage with the bankers. Okay. And so I'm delighted to see that some of that's already taking hold and we're getting some good uh, feedback on that. And the second is the way we look at underwriting. We came out with the new predictive uh, score that we think helps banks get to yes a little easier. So I'd love to share that with, with uh, you in, in more detail. But just to the point here, I'm just really delighted at how cooperative across uh, President Obama's administration, that across all the departments, everybody's cooperating on the, are their SBIR goals. And so, you know, that's where we set aside so much of the research dollars out of each agency for innovation and research. So I was very encouraged to see that in our reauthorization, we've been able to increase that number, which will allow us to spur more innovation and more uh, work around the country through small businesses. Okay. So I, I think that's really good news. And second, just again, in terms of database and allowing folks to use our databases, what we're doing now, we're going to be launching this very eminently, I'm pleased to say, that we're going to be putting the database collecting all of the research, all of the technological advances, all in one place at the SBA, so that people don't have to go to every single agency to find out what's mm -hmm. research and what developments are occurring. We'll have it yeah. all at the SBA. Thank you. That's terrific. Vanessa, you've attracted a lot of support here on your first, <laughs> your, your first outing. Uh, Jim, Any other comments? Just uh, one Jeff? thing, and, yeah. and you've been supportive, Boeing's been yeah. supportive, Lockheed's been supportive of an initiative that we're launching which is to basically take the fact that large businesses don't have an access to capital problem. In fact, their capital is quite cheap now, yeah. whereas small businesses either can't get it or it's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. So we're modeling this after something that uh, Cameron did in the UK, which is to have big businesses step forward and say, we'll provide financing to small businesses in our supply chain at close or at mm -hmm. our cost of capital. Yeah. So we want to get as many of the big businesses here signed yeah. up we did this in the federal government by paying small business contractors faster 
and that's had a real yeah. impact. And we want to do the same thing with the private sector. This is coming together real time. Yeah. We're probably going to launch it in the next few weeks. And the more big businesses on board, the more we can benefit small businesses. And I think a lot of us already are. Yes. I think a lot of us already are. And Fred has a similar initiative on export finance, uh, uh, leveraging the credit of the, of the top of the supply chain. So I think, Vanessa, I think uh, everybody's, there's, there is zero controversy about your letter. So without objection, why don't we adopt it? All right. <laughs> uh, Gene, uh, you have, where's Gene? There he is. Right here. The Thank president you. always comes during <laughs> your letter, so why don't we hurry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's hurry through this. Right? Twice, twice this has happened. I so, know, I know. It's by design, too, right, Jim? Technology enabled small uh, business yes. exporters. Thank you. Gene, uh, the, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the SME committee has been very busy since our last meeting. Um, we have hosted several uh, roundtables. Chairman Hochberg uh, attended one in Los Angeles. Uh, Secretary Fox uh, in March uh, came to Los Angeles and spoke to about 800 SMEs. And uh, then we just recently held a, uh, a round table in Los Angeles where we had great feedback. Uh, some of the positive that came out of that was um, free trade agreements with uh, Colombia. Uh, one company mentioned that uh, since that trade agreement, the company is four times as large as it was before. Uh, the SBA, XM Bank, uh, has played a big role in, 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 in that success. Quite interesting, uh, the, uh, the roundtable discussion surfaced a new uh, area, uh, type of exporter that needs our attention. It's called the Consumer Driven Technology Enable Small Business. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Donahoe from uh, Google has played a major role in, in, in driving this. Okay. So he's not here, but he wanted me to at least say a few words, uh, and I will. Okay. He said, thank you for providing the opportunity to present some thoughts on the emergence of technology in able small business. Business exporters, and I apologize that I'm not able to present the letter in person. Technology, particularly the internet, is enabling SMEs to take their business to a global audience in a way that was never possible, possible before. A traditional Main Street business can now use the internet to sell its products or services online and reach nearly 3 billion users. These businesses maintain a local presence and participate directly in their local economy, but also increase revenue through access to customers around the world. And I'll just wrap it up here. Um, <laughs> despite these tremendous new global well, <laughs> opportunities, right frictions remain for consumer-driven technology Next. enable SMEs. Government policy can play a meaningful role to reduce these frictions. When frictions are removed, inclusive global commerce, local jobs, and opportunity grows in communities across America. I look forward to working with the administration and partners in industry to ensure that technology enable SMEs, exporters realize their full potential. So that's the essence of the comments, and we basically want to get an endorsement for the letter. Okay. Gene, I just, I just want to uh, note for everybody that no one works harder at the grassroots level on the PEC than you do. Thank you. You know, at the community level, at the small business level, your leadership has made a big, huge difference. And it's, so you're not just writing letters, no. you're doing the work. So It's the team. It's, it's the team. I highly, highly appreciate it. Any, uh, any additional comment or objections? With no objection, we'll adopt it. Uh, we're going to try for an eighth letter here before the president comes. I think Bob, uh, Robert Wolf was going to outline support for the uh, Import Export Bank. And you got Fred right to your right there. So. Hey. Well, they put the, me in the middle of former Massachusetts Senator and now <laughs> Senator Joldebrand, but I'm still a Boston Red Sox fan. I want to <laughs> let you know. Listen, it's uh, dear cabinet members, administration members, elected officials, Chairman McNerney and Vice Chairman Burns, a member of the PAC. It's an honor to present today such an important and critical issue for the economy the Export-Import Bank Reauthorization. I'm pleased to report that the PEC agrees with and fully supports the President's proposal to provide the Exim Bank five-year reauthorization with a $160 billion cap by September 30th. Now I would like to emphasize a few points for the record. The Exim financing supports small businesses. In fiscal year 2013, the Exim Bank provided over $5 billion and financing to nearly 3,000 small businesses. That's over 90% of all Exim transactions. Secondly, it increases U.S. competitiveness. 60 other countries 
provide Exum credit financing to support their businesses. Third, ending Exum is essentially economic, economic unilateral disarmament and harms American workers. I meet with CEOs around the globe daily, and the Exum reauthorization is coming up now every day. They don't understand the debate. Four, actually, the Exim Bank earns interest for taxpayers and money. The bank charges an interest rate on all transactions. Since 2009, the Exim Bank has generated, and I will repeat this, generated over $2 billion to contribute to the Treasury Department's general fund. And lastly, since 1934, the Exim's net losses on its entire portfolio has been less than 1.5%. And as of March 31st, the report to Congress, the bank defaults rate was less than one quarter of 1%. As the only Wall Street guy here, I can tell you, that's an incredible, incredible job by Chairman Hochberg and the Exim staff. We are urging all members of the President's Export Council, all of the elected officials to go back to their states all the communities around the globe to support the Exum reauthorization by September 30th. Thank you. Robert, thanks for that strong, strong letter. Are there any additional comments? I think it's uh, under I'll the just heading. I comment that yeah. this is essentially a no-brainer. It should be a no-brainer. It's uh, one that we can't take our eye off of because it's not without a huge yeah. amount of opposition. So we will need to help you and we will yeah. Um, we will do that. Yeah, I think uh, there's a major BRT initiative yesterday on the Hill, and it's uh, one of the top priorities, and we, we will keep working it. A lot of us in the room uh, feel very strongly about it, and, and so should our economy. Um, Ursula, you want to try for the last, so we'll try for try the for the last letter? We might actually get it done. Yeah. This is a short uh, Penny. This is supporting NEI Next, which Penny Dr. outlined. Yeah. Yeah. On behalf of the PAC, we're pleased. I am pleased to present this letter that encourages the administration to ensure that private sector input remains a key guiding principle in the development of the second phase of the NEI strategy, the NEI Next, which Penny talked about. Significant progress has been made under the current export strategy, and I am pleased to see that the government has implemented many of the recommendations of this private sector advisory group. I believe that this kind of public and private partnership is the only way to improve and to move forward and strengthen our exports um, to other countries. I encourage you to continue and even ramp up your dialogue with the private sector. We will need to be engage in some bold and outside of the box thinking. We have begun implementation of the low hanging fruit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, great to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right. Nobody has to be quiet. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is probably the place. There you go. I didn't. I couldn't quite get the vote out. I'm good. How are you? Hey, good to see you. Should I just ask for the vote right now? Hi, Vanessa Kaichin. Nice to see you. All in favor of Ursula's letter? You're busy. Good. We're set. You're busy. Ms. Rainer, do you mind if I move this over just a little? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you give it to him? And then Penny and I can share. Well, uh, hello, everybody. Sorry to interrupt the flow of the meeting. 
but uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you who, uh, who are here. Some of you have been serving uh, on our Export Council for quite some time. Uh, some of you uh, are here uh, you know, as, as new additions, but all of you uh, have been uh, extraordinarily successful in, in your various fields. And uh, it gives us uh, an enormous opportunity to hear from you in very concrete terms about how we can uh, advance uh, not just America's export agenda, but uh, how we can build uh, the kind of economic future that we want uh, for our kids and our grandkids. Um, you know, for the last 51 months, uh, we have created jobs here in the United States, uh, 9.4 million jobs in all. Uh, but we're going to have to create more. And one of the best ways to do it is to boost American manufacturing and American exports. Uh, that's why, uh, since I came into office, uh, we have been promoting American products and businesses when I travel overseas. It's why we created the President's Export Council in 2010. Uh, there are some of the most iconic companies in the world, uh, Boeing being an example, Xerox being another one. Uh, and with your help, exports have driven one-third of the economic growth in our recovery and now support over 11 million U.S. jobs. Last year, we exported $2.3 trillion in goods and services, uh, which was an all-time high. And business executives around the globe uh, say that the United States is the best place to locate, the best place to invest, and the best place to hire. And that's the first time that they've said that, that we are number one when it comes to their uh, lo desirable location to, to invest. This is the first time they've said that uh, in over a decade. So the Made in America brand is stronger than ever. And as we saw yesterday at the first White House Maker Fair, I, I uh, was out there watching these 22-year-olds coming up with uh, incredible things. Uh, it is going to be a, a remarkable future that we have to look ahead to because um, in many ways manufacturing is becoming easier. Some of the barriers to entry are, are lowering. Uh, it gives inventors and entrepreneurs uh, the opportunity to create new products and services in ways that we can't even imagine. And we want to make sure that uh, all those trends uh, uh, accelerate here in the United States. So this is a moment of opportunity. Uh, we've got a chance to expend, uh, extend our competitive advantage in the world. Uh, that, that's what this meeting is about. Uh, one thing I want to focus on today is opening up even more uh, new markets to Made in America products. Uh, we're working very hard to finalize trade agreements with our partners in Europe and in Asia that will make us the center of a free trade hub covering two-thirds of the world economy. Uh, and Mr. Michael Froman uh, has been putting in a lot of miles, uh, uh, trying to make sure that that happens. And I know he's consulted with some of you, not just big companies, but a lot of small and medium-sized businesses who uh, have enormous opportunities if we're able to open up these markets, and oftentimes are the ones that have the hardest time navigating through uh, some of the barriers that are out there. Uh, I especially want to increase trade and investment in the region, uh, and this is going to be uh, one of the issues we discuss uh, you know, in August, there has been some explosive growth in certain parts of the world where we're just not doing enough. Africa is being a, a prime example. You've got six of the ten fastest growing economies in Africa, uh, a, a young population that is growing rapidly. Some of these economies are doing very, very well, uh, but we're not penetrating those markets as well as we should have. And uh, I think uh, we've got a great opportunity in August with an Africa Leaders Summit that's going to be taking place for us to talk about trade and commerce, because that's really what uh, that continent is interested in. They're not interested in, in aid as much as they are trade, uh, development, uh, and partnering uh, with the private sector. Uh, and as your businesses know well, when we export products overseas, we're creating jobs and opportunities here at home. Uh, that's the focus here today and every day of my presidency. Uh, how do we create uh, thriving businesses that are also uh, able to uh, uh, create great jobs uh, that allow people not just to stay in the middle class, but uh, to, uh, to work their way into the middle class if, uh, uh, if they work hard and take responsibility. And all of you have done that. This council uh, is, uh, is doing great work. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jay to uh, hear about some of the ideas that you've come up with and how we can uh, help advance this, uh, this agenda. Well, 
Again, thank you for your attendance. It, uh, it energizes us and, and reminds us of the importance of our work. Uh, and, and we appreciate your comments about our engagement. I think uh, we are going to send you a record uh, nine letters coming out of this meeting. We just we discussed them, and they there, there are a couple of themes, one of which is around this manufacturing and technology innovation and its enablement. And uh, we've had some discussion that, that uh, Jeff and Penny have, have led before you came here that, that uh, reminds us of the importance of that. And uh, I think um, uh, we had sort of held off discussing that until you, until you came here because of your leadership, uh, personal leadership there. And, uh, I think one of the letters you're going to get is from Vanessa, uh, uh, our small business startup star from Oregon, who uh, is talking about finding new ways to finance uh, small businesses, often technology-based, uh, and its importance for us to focus on that issue. And uh, so I think um, we were hoping maybe you'd talk a little bit about, uh, elaborate a little bit on what you said right. about enabling small businesses not only to export but just to become a bigger part of our economy and the role of manufacturing and technology innovation. We're delighted to hear of that emphasis because it's Good. at the heart of what a lot of us do around here. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to know how much uh, Schultz paid you to, to position <laughs> the uh, Starbucks. Yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm sure Howard's catching that on television. Right <laughs> <now>. um, <laughs> they did a good thing uh, with uh, uh, announcing a scholarship program uh, with yes. Arizona State, which I think is, is worth companies looking at. Um, you know, I, I think what I'd like to do is, is, is begin with some of this technology and innovation, mm. uh, because as I said yesterday, we have this amazing uh, collection of folks. Uh, over the last couple of days, we've been talking about uh, what do things like 3D printing and uh, the revolution in, in uh, making stuff that, that initially was just uh, using software for data and information, and now suddenly uh, it's starting to move into uh, uh, the three-dimensional space and is, is still in its infancy. It's, it's still where the Internet probably was 25, 30 years ago, but uh, there are enormous opportunities there. And it, it, it was a reminder when you see some young person who invented an incubator that's uh, 200 bucks and is already saving 60,000 lives of preemie babies around the world, uh, or uh, you know, uh, high school kids who are, uh, develop a sports car that gets 100 miles a gallon uh, as part of their class project. It just gives you a sense of uh, why it is that we've been an economic superpower in, in, in the past and, and uh, why we have to maintain that. So. Um, one person that I thought uh, uh, would, would be great to comment on this is, uh, is Marilyn Hewson uh, from Lockheed Martin, uh, obviously one of our greatest innovators, uh, and uh, occupies a unique section uh, position in our manufacturing sector. Uh, so uh, I, I know this is something that uh, folks have been thinking about. Uh, let, let's turn to Marilyn and uh, uh, hear what the conversation uh, has, has yielded so far. Well, thank you, Mr. President. You know, as an advanced technology company like Lockheed Martin, investing in research and development is absolutely critical to our business. It's critical to growth. It's critical to sustaining the business. And as you said, it's what generates jobs throughout the supply chain. Over 60 percent of our business goes out into the supply chain to small and medium-sized businesses. So what we invest in flows all the way through. We are investing in a lot of uh, merging technologies as well as current technologies, from robotics to quantum computing to hypersonic aircraft that can fly Mach 6. So our engineers and scientists are working on that every day. But to your point, the manufacturing process is, is another area that we're investing in. This additive manufacturing or 3D printing that you brought up, and I know you spent some time on it here, but also in Pittsburgh this week, and there's a lot of excitement around it. What's exciting to us at Lockheed Martin is the, the ability to take it to large-scale manufacturing environments and do complex parts. And we are doing some of that, and we're finding that relative to traditional manufacturing and design, it's reducing the cost about 80 percent, and it's getting the parts faster. So we have it today. We've got parts, titanium parts, on the NASA Juno spacecraft that's on its way now to Jupiter. And it's exciting that we were yielding those very results from 3D printing of those parts. I think uh, the more that we can invest as a company 
and the companies around this table in research and development, in manufacturing processes. That's what's going to generate the jobs for us in the U.S., and that's what's going to allow us to take those to other markets. And this, this body is about export and trade, and in, in, in that exporting arena, if we can get those products to market faster through things like 3D printing, that's what's going to make a big difference for our, for our companies. That's great. And, and, and obviously, uh, a big chunk of this is, uh, is R&D investment by your company, but uh, obviously, uh, I think it's not just defense contractors that recognize the degree to which federal R&D and basic research uh, ends up being critical in us maintaining uh, that technological edge. And uh, a lot of the folks that I saw out in that yard yesterday were MIT professors <laughs> and Stanford professors, and uh, they, they continually reminded me that all this neat stuff that they're coming up with that eventually have commercial applications uh, start off uh, in, in laboratories and, and uh, in research facilities because uh, you know, it's the nature of basic research that uh, you don't know if it's going to pay off. And so it's oftentimes more difficult to justify. Uh, you know, the days of the old Bell uh, Labs where, uh, you know, if you had monopolies, you, you had enough money to go ahead and sink in a whole bunch of kooky stuff. Those days are over. You guys got to watch your bottom lines a little more. So the federal government has to make sure that it's doing its job uh, on that front. Good. Um, as you mentioned, Vanessa, uh, uh, yep. one, one of our uh, small business stars, although I don't know how small it's going to stay since she's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, since she's so good. Uh, uh, Vanessa, you want to talk a little bit about, uh, as, as the CEO of a startup, what, does, uh, what role do you see in uh, spurring innovation in the economy, and how does that link up with our export agenda? Because a lot of times, Folks figure if you're small or medium size, yeah. you're not thinking about uh, overseas markets. Yeah, no, that's not true. Um, coming from the green building market and the USGBC really pushing the green building standards, startups and entrepreneurial companies in that sector really have to look at innovative products around data and performance. How are we really affecting the environment when we build these buildings? And so as a small company, a startup, we actually received a commercialization grant from our state to partner up with our local university, Portland State University, to develop a rain lab, basically to assimilate rainstorms all around the world so we could develop green roof technology around those types of storms and what cities are impacting so that we can help with their infrastructure issues around flooding. So that modeling allowed us to develop a tool where we can manufacture green roof technology for that particular city and the storms that are going to be coming over the next two, five, and 100 years. So what that does, it allows us, I think, to have innovative green manufacturing, for example. And as we continue to export, there are these same environmental green building standards and issues around the world. We want to be a leader in green and green building. And having that um, commercialization grant, working with the universities, develop these labs, get the performance data, will actually, I believe, be a leader and beat other countries around the world in this area because quality is really important, how we manufacture quality to meet these, these standards, and uh, we're positioning ourselves to do that. That's great. Good. Yeah. Um, well, just one last uh, uh, area, and then maybe we can open it up a, a, a little bit. Uh, obviously, one of the areas where we've been uh, an incredible innovation leader has been in uh, you know, agricultural products, food processing. Um, and uh, my home state uh, company, ADM, uh, is pretty good at that. Uh, so Pat, although I, I think I hear, hear uh, Coldplay. <laughs> That's for you. It's not Putin's ring. I've become an expert at, at uh, hearing people's uh, rings. You know? I'm pretty sure that was Coldplay. <laughs> Pat? Well, thank you for the uh, uh, opportunity to talk about technology a little bit with agriculture and food products. Sometimes, as, uh, as, as you know, ADM is a big manufacturer of corn-based ethanol. Many people think of that as a first generation. But because of technology and technological innovation, we've taken it to uh, much lower cost, lower energy usage, over sustain higher sustainability, uh, more waste products. And as also a result of market conditions and this innovation, what started sort of as a homegrown fuel, thinking about using it in the U.S., 
Now we export, the industry does, up to a billion gallons a year. And because it's such a low cost transportation fuel, other areas of the world are very much looking for our, our fuels as well. So it's become an export uh, due to that technology and that innovation. And it's laid the platform for the advanced stages of technology to go to much more second and third generation uh, fuels. On the food side of agriculture, um, innovation has led to a lot of, in our country, of course, we think about health and nutrition. And so health and wellness is a big effort of our uh, R&D centers. And that is, of course, interested and in being in, um, more interested in developing countries as well. So as the population grows, more use of protein, more uh, stealth nutrition, so to speak. So to put protein, to put fibers, to put natural sweeteners, much more healthful products in everything, not only that we might consume in this country, but is much larger um, demand and much higher growth rates, exports, and internationally. That's great. So while I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to put you back in charge, why don't we, uh, <laughs> okay. why, why, why don't we see if... Uh, you know, I thought one thing that might be of, of interest to you that might lead to a broader discussion is, is Ginny on cross-data border flows. Sort of in a post-Snowden world, people are sort of wrapping themselves in the cloak of privacy to achieve protectionist goals. And Ginny made a sort of a compelling case, and it's going to embody itself in a letter to you. So Ginny Rometty, would you, of IBM, would you just make the president aware? I know it's your third time third this morning time. making a speech. <laughs> I know but, anyone could give the speech now. It might, <laughs> yeah. And I know Mike Froman's all over it, but it, it's... Uh, he is in, in both Secretary Prisker and Ambassador Froman, um, you should know, have been very helpful in this already because there have been a number of instances already pulled back as a result of the efforts of the administration. Um, but it is this idea that uh, in the post-Snowden world, as Jim described, uh, one reaction is to keep data in your borders or don't let it flow across borders and say things that may seem sort of uh, innocent about, well, let's keep all those servers right in this country. And in effect, what we often see is that that is, as Jim just described, uh, under the veil of security and privacy, when in the end it's a form of protectionism and it's a form of really advocation by many local companies who would say, this would be great for my business. So I think it, it pertains not only to be able to sell globally, that isn't even it. It's really about operating, and even for their own economies it's not good because many companies make money if you're in one European country to another European country, and or government services that you need that cross, we were talking about travel earlier, as et cetera. So um, it's really not good any way you look at it, but you do see then this proliferation. And so um, I, we really do appreciate the administration's efforts here to bat these down, but of course, Ambassador Froman, really getting them tied down well in the new trade agreements to recognize this form of digital trade is essential to not just operate, not just sell, but for government to be efficient as yeah. well. Well, they, we, we've been all over this uh, from the, the, the get-go. Obviously, there have been uh, enormous commercial implications to uh, the, the Snowden disclosures. And as indicated, in some cases, there have been some legitimate concerns about uh, privacy issues. Oftentimes, uh, those dovetail with uh, either purely commercial uh, interests in these countries that are uh, as Jenny just said, looking to make sure it's their servers in their facilities uh, with their nationals who are uh, uh, handling this data. Uh, in some cases, there are countries that have been for a long time uncomfortable with the openness of the Internet uh, and have been using this as an excuse to see if they can balkanize the Internet and build their own platforms uh, that they would have greater control over. Uh, in both cases, what we've said is, you've got legitimate concerns, we will be able to uh, respond to them. Uh, illegitimate concerns, we're going to challenge. Uh, and you're right that uh, both uh, TPP, uh, the Trade uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and uh, TTIP, the European uh, Trade Agreement that we're working on, uh, will have to have uh, these kinds of uh, 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 an architecture that uh, preserves uh, fair and free trade within uh, this realm. I would just add, while we're on this topic, uh, that we're spending a lot of time thinking generally about big data, its implications for uh, every aspect of the economy. How do we make sure that we have uh, protected people's privacy, 
and are uh, mindful about potential abuses of uh, big data, but also that we're taking advantage of opportunities. You know, the, the federal government has enormous stores of data. Um, you know, our, most of your weather apps on your smartphone is because of government data that somebody figured out how to uh, make easily accessible and, and, and uh, commercialized. Healthcare is an area, for example, where the, the possibilities are endless for us uh, as we uh, learn more about the human genome. Uh, our ability to potentially detect diseases, uh, design uh, drugs for specific diseases, individualized medicine so we know it's more effective, uh, huge possibilities. But all that stuff is, has to be done in a way that uh, uh, preserves uh, our, our, our privacy and our values. So uh, John Podesta has been uh, leading a group in consultation with uh, a number of companies interested in this space. And uh, we'll continue to report out because this is something that will be relevant uh, internationally. And, and uh, uh, if we get it right, then uh, it allows us to uh, have other goods and services that we may be able to export as well. But uh, other countries are not always as good about some of the uh, IP behind this, and, uh, and we've got to think it through. You know, it's uh, an adjacent point. Uh, that we talked about earlier, and, and Scott, I'm headed toward you a little bit, is the use of technology and trade facilitation. You know, a more mundane use of technology, but one that is critically important to, to, to making stuff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you got it. it the yeah, no one likes to use that word. <laughs> but maybe you could make a comment or two again on, on that for the President. Well, it, just in, in general, I think that, that one thing we're seeing today is we're actually seeing small and medium-sized businesses show more interest in exporting. It's been, we've been working with, with the Commerce Department for a long time. Very small minority export. Today, I think with e-commerce particularly, you know, we're seeing huge demand out of the e-commerce customers to, to do it. They don't have the resources to handle the cumbersome procedures at customs and, and border. But I think that, that you know, the, the progress we're making, obviously on the trade facilitation agreement, we, we got to push hard to implement it quicker. I think the Executive order on the single window simplifies things. We were excited about doing that. I think de minimis, raising de minimis. I know it's a battle from Ambassador Froman with some of the other countries, but that makes it much easier, I think, for these small businesses to do it. Mm -hmm. So the exciting thing right now is there's still not enough doing it. Most of them that do export go to one country, but, but the level of interest is growing tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And I think I appreciate uh, your work on that, Scott. And, and uh, <coughs> Robert, uh, Maybe XM was one that we spent a lot of time on. The fight's a little tougher than it's been in the past on the Hill, Mr. President, as you know. We've got well, Mr. Some, President, I want to so. let you know you will also receive a letter from the PEC that we fully support and endorse the five-year reauthorization of the XM Bank and the cap moving to $160 billion. It's clear that the majority of businesses around the United States, as well as businesses around the globe, support the Exxon Bank of the United States. It is, one, it lends to small businesses. 90% of transactions went to small businesses from the U.S. Exxon Bank. Two, it earns money. Three, it creates jobs. And four, it increases our competitiveness. And without it would be literally unconscionable. And so we are fully supportive that this gets done by September 30th, and you'll receive our letter. I assume that, uh, Jim, You've been in contact with PRT and Chain. Oh, yes. And yes. Oh, yes. And yeah. with every congressman and yeah. senator I can find, we're, we're helping. <laughs> and, you know, I think one of the – Fred has morphed XM, and the, and the argument is stronger now because of the small business engagement that you've achieved with some of your new st structured products and, and initiatives. And, uh, and, he, and Fred's found some clever ways to leverage big businesses who get – loan guarantees from XM into helping the credit ratings of smaller businesses in their supply chain. So I think the discussion can be a little more broad-based as we, as we approach the, the politicians out there. Congressman Reichert, did you have a comment on this? On this? Speaking of which, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I thank you. I, I uh, still like to think of myself as the sheriff back in, the, in Seattle, <laughs> yeah. so did that for 33 years. 
Uh, I just look like I've been here 40 years. Uh, Mr. President, uh, my name is Dave Reichert. I'm from Washington State. And uh, of course, the most trade dependent state in, in the country, about one out of every three jobs is, is connected to trade. And uh, we, uh, we've been working real hard. I'm on the Ways and Means Committee. I'm on the Trade Subcommittee. And uh, when the Chorus Agreement, Columbia Agreement, Panama Agreement uh, was being discussed, uh, we formed a, a team that we called the Chorus Working Group, very successful in working with uh, then Ambassador Kirk and, and your administration and, and really enjoyed uh, that opportunity. Um, we now have a group that uh, we have organized that hopefully you've heard of. It's called the Friends of TPP. <laughs> and, uh, it's a great group. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Greg Meeks uh, from New York, uh, Ron Kine from Wisconsin, uh, Charles Bastani and myself, Charles from uh, Louisiana, have put this group together. And, and I just wanted to mention that our, our relationship with Mr. Froman, Ambassador Froman, has been excellent. Their staff has been excellent. We've been working together hard on TPP, but we all recognize, and this has been, this was the first letter discussed this morning, and, and I'm going to guess that that's because it's one of the most important letters, uh, the importance of TPA. And, and uh, we, as the friends of TPP, would like to offer our help to you and meet, meet with you. That would be an extra special treat. But staff and Mr. Froman, to see how we can gather and garner more support in Congress on both the Senate side and the House side, we're ready to work with you. Uh, the second thing I wanted to, to mention um, as far as the uh, access to capital for small business, both the Senate and the House have been working hard on tax extenders, uh, as you know. There is agreement in, in, in both the uh, Senate and the House on tax extenders. It's just a disagreement on how long to extend uh, these uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> bills like the built-in gains tax, the, the R&D uh, tax credit, which we talked about, which I think really lends itself to providing some certainty for our uh, businesses across the country, and I think that's what they're looking for uh, more than anything. And so again, we offer our help, Democrats and Republicans yep. at the table today, we offer our help to all of you. I'm a charter member of the group and, uh, and happy to be here, and it's just an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this morning, sir, and I appreciate the time to make some comments. Well, the, uh, I appreciate uh, you, Congressman, for the work you're doing. Uh, obviously, Kirsten and uh, uh, you know, our outstanding uh, Minnesota senator, who we're going to be seeing, uh, Amy. Uh, and I thanked her for Jared Allen earlier. Yeah, yeah that's a, she really believes that, in exports. That, that, that could be very helpful. Um, I, I will tell you that uh, you know, the work we're doing around these, these big trade deals, the work that uh, Mike is doing, uh, is a, as ambitious as anything that we've done in a very long time. And it's, you know, there have been some questions raised about, well, you know, is now the time for trade? And uh, I think in some cases, um, you know, issues have surfaced around uh, its impact on environmental standards or uh, labor standards. And what I say to folks who are concerned about these issues is, you should get all the facts. Uh, you should uh, you know, raise all your questions. But oftentimes, people are fighting battles from 20, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, the, 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 the truth of the matter is today, um, uh, the issue is not whether a company can move to China. If, if, if they wanted to move, they, they could move under the current regime. The question is, can we start getting more companies to come back? Can we raise standards in the Asia Pacific region? Can we make environmental and labor standards and intellectual pr uh, property uh, protections uh, strong enough? Because that will advantage our companies. Uh, and that's what this trade deal does. It, it's not, it's going to lower some barriers, but a lot of what uh, these trade deals are doing is strengthening uh, standards in such a way that companies that play by the rules. Uh, and countries that play by the rules uh, are going to benefit, and those who uh, are skirting the rules 
uh, are going to find that there are stronger enforcement mechanisms in place than there have been in the past. Uh, and nowhere is that more true than in, in something like intellectual property. We just talked about innovation. It's mm -hmm. tough to innovate if you know that somebody's going to do a knockoff of your innovation uh, six months later uh, and undercut uh, your, your, your market. So uh, I, I really appreciate the work that you're doing on this. Uh, it is going to be a bipartisan piece of legislation. I will be happy to meet with uh, friends of TPP. I, I think it's probably more important for me to meet with the enemies of TPP. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's always nice to get some encouragement uh, before I, I go into the lion's den. Uh, so, uh, uh, but, but obviously we'd benefit from some, uh, from, uh, some uh, strategizing, uh, figuring out uh, how we want to frame the issues, what questions other members have heard that they're most concerned about uh, that, that we can respond to. So um, with that, I've gotten my cue that uh, uh, I, I've, I'm going to a, a meeting that's probably not as fun as this one, uh, but, uh, but important as well. I just want to say uh, to Jim and, and Ursula uh, and to everybody uh, on the council, thank you so much for your leadership. We really appreciate it. All right? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I think uh, that kind of engagement, for those of you that are new, we've come to expect and appreciate from the President. So, uh, we, again, on behalf of all of us, we thank you. I think now we have an opportunity for Secretary Kerry to make some comments. Uh, Secretary Kerry, it's great to have you here. Uh, Jen, thank you very much. I'm going to appreciate your leadership enormously. and. Uh, I'm going to have to race through this a little bit because I have to be at this uh, unpleasant meeting that we're about to have. <laughs> I may be one of the reasons it'll be unpleasant. <laughs> uh, or at least I may bring the news to <laughs> help make it unpleasant at any rate. Uh, let me just say that I, I, I uh, have a great sense of, of what is happening here for a lot of different reasons. Number one, I spent a lot of years as the chair of the Small Business Committee in the Senate. Uh, so much of what you're talking about, Vanessa and others, are you know, uh, completely in sync with and understand. In fact, we were pushing very hard to teach small businesses how they could, in fact, uh, export. And I think we began a process of uh, connecting them to the Internet and to those entities that help people to be able to do so. But uh, what, I, what I want to begin by saying to all of you is that um, I want to thank you and, and underscore the degree to which I run into this all around the world, that American business is absolutely extraordinary. And while I, uh, and I think all of us, have deep appreciation of the very difficult, people have forgotten what it was like when President Obama came in in 2009. In fact, even before he came in, the Bush administration was turning to him as the president-elect to ask him what he was willing to support. And he was making decisions about bailout and decision, you know, where Congress should go well before he was sworn in. And the degree to which those decisions created the framework for a recovery was critical. But we know that in the end, the government decisions create the framework and the structure, your decisions and your innovation, your commitment to R&D, your commitment to uh, innovate are really what make the difference. You create the jobs, uh, small business and uh, what become big businesses because of those decisions. And it is, I, I run into this all around the world that you know, people have enormous respect and jealousy for what we are able to do here. And it's one of the reasons why we are such a safe haven for investment and so powerful uh, uh, globally though challenged. And, and the second thing I want to say is that what we're talking about here is not just about business. It is the projection of American power. It is our leverage to be able to have an impact in solving a lot of problems. And it is vital to the security of the United States because to the degree that we can uh, 
project economic opportunity, take it to export economic opportunity to places, we address the crisis of millions, literally millions of young people in places where they don't have opportunity, there's abject poverty, and that is the breeder of terrorism. And that's what we're fighting in places where there are concerted efforts to grab these young people, in, indoctrinate them, and then put them on their way. I'm telling you, all over the place. There, countless foreign ministers have told me about the challenges in their countries of these young people who don't have jobs. So I came into this job 100% committed to a fundamental notion that foreign policy is economic policy and economic policy is foreign policy. And in today's world, more than ever before, because of globalization, which no one can ever, and want, you know, if you're smart, you don't want to, but some places try to put the genie back in the bottle and uh, it's not gonna happen. We also are facing much more intense competition from other countries than ever before, and you all know this, too. And I might add, and it's been an eye-opener to me, even as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, I, I, I have not seen, uh, I hadn't seen the levels of corruption that I see as I travel to various places. And, and it's pandemic and dangerous, and you all are competing in a world where you have to deal with that. So it's tricky. It's as tricky as it's ever been. Um, and I think there are a couple of things. Each of the letters are important. And, and in our department, we deal with almost every one of these letters. We are linked to you. And I'm proud to say with Penny, we have the best relationship with the Commerce Department we've ever had, the most productive uh, sort of combination of, of, of commitment. And we're working very effectively to maximize our projection of economic capacity abroad. And I'll just say a couple of quick words about all of that. Um, uh, we are currently selling more goods and services abroad than any time in our history, but we could do better. One of the things I remember when I was a senator traveling to Hong Kong, uh, we, uh, I was dumbstruck. We had three foreign commercial service officers. And they told me we were losing billions of dollars of business because there are RFPs they couldn't keep up with. And the French and the British and others had these vast pavilions and were able to do business and convene uh, and sell and market. And we weren't in the game as much because, you know, we're sort of taken for granted to some degree or have historically. We don't anymore. And, and, and we also have had uh, a record 70 million international visitors came to the United States. So I've pressed our diplomats. I've, I've issued instructions. Historically in the State Department, being the economic officer in, a, in an embassy was not necessarily a route to ambassador and promotion or even to the highest jobs. Now we want to make sure everybody in the department is an economic officer. I mean that. And I've sent uh, cables to every single embassy and outpost in the world instructing people to engage in proactive, uh, forceful economic outreach. We've created a uh, direct line. We've asked our ambassadors to call U.S. businesses directly to explain foreign business climates and foreign business opportunities. And in 2013, our ambassadors held 87 large conference calls, average of 30 companies participating on each call. In 2014, we've already had 31. And our goal is to do 100, and our surveys show that over 80% of the businesses that participate in those say they will make a proactive business decision based on the call. So that's creating further export and engagement. We are creating a business information, we have created a business information data system uh, base called BIDS, where we identify the opportunities for business overseas. We've collected over 100 billion in infrastructure projects or foreign opportunities on the site now, and we encourage businesses to investigate the opportunities there. We want to promote it more and find ways to. We are working with Select USA um, and are sending our ambassadors out to shake the economic tree and, and, and try to engage uh, more effectively. I am hugely uh, supportive of and talk about everywhere uh, the TT. Uh, IP and the TPP. These are enormous opportunities. 
And we need to, you know, we're prepared to come help sell Congress. It is not just, as I say, part of an economic uh, benefit to us. It is going to be critical to Europe's resurgence, uh, to this effort to uh, provide job opportunities in vast parts of the world and to raise the standards and fight back against uh, corruption and other things. In addition, we have an African Leader Summit for the first time in history. We will have almost every president, leader of Africa come here in the beginning of August. Businesses will be deeply involved in that. We're working through uh, everything we're going to do there. And I want you to think about it. I was just in the DRC and in Angola, Ethiopia, South Sudan, which is more of a complex thing. But the opportunities are just stunning. The Chinese are there in force. They're building everything for them. They're bringing their people there to build it, which is not terrific in terms of policy and otherwise. Uh, they're not loved. The Russians are there. We are loved, and we're not there enough. And it's not because we don't want it. It's because, you know, with all due respect, we've got to get a Congress that is willing to put some meat behind this policy. Uh, and it pays 100 times over. We've got to find a way to invest more in these kinds of initiatives. In addition, I'll just end quickly, the... Uh, uh, we're working very hard on the level playing field issues. We intervene constantly, particularly, obviously, with China and some other countries. We continually work out just in Poland where we signed an agreement, a framework to establish bilateral uh, innovation, collaboration to bring uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, financiers, educators together in order to maximize, create the witch's brew of new innovation and opportunity. <coughs> we want to replicate that in other countries. Uh, and, by, and last thing, uh, with respect to sort of what we're doing, uh, the Bureau of Consular Affairs, we are super focused on the visa issue and facilitation. We've just had some meetings, but, here's the but, we got foreign fighters in Syria, and they come from America, from Britain, from Holland, from France, from Germany, a lot of places. And even as we want to facilitate with the waiver program and other things, we got to make sure, folks, we are not turning a blind eye to the possibility these people are going to come over here and elsewhere. So there's always going to be a balance. We think we can work that through and still facilitate a quick and easy entry, which we want to do. And that brings me to literally la oh, our team. I've hired a terrific new team over there. We have uh, undersecretary for Economic Affairs, Kathy Novelli, who came from Apple uh, Computer. Uh, she uh, is uh, doing a terrific job already. We just had a two-day extraordinary conference on oceans uh, and, and uh, economic opportunity there. Uh, Charlie Rifkin, who's here with me, is the Assistant Secretary for Economic and Business Affairs. He was our U.S. Ambassador to France. And before that, he helped turn the Jim Henson Company into a billion-dollar enterprise. Uh, and Scott Nathan is a, a former fund manager from Boston. He runs the Department Office of Commercial and Business Affairs and other people coming in. So we are building a team that knows business, comes from business, understands how to project and what to do. Last, last comment I make is this. I heard the talk about infrastructure and uh, uh, we're working a very new innovative program to try to marry the XM, OPEC, AID, World Bank, IMF, and private sector in a way that they haven't been brought together. Our model is being put to work in the West Bank, Palestine. And we are trying to change lives, create investment where it wouldn't normally happen with a long-term view to the possibilities for the return on that investment, which are real. Coca-Cola is a big participant in this and others, and we want to encourage everybody to do it. But the, you know, we, you all, I beg you, I'm going to put my Senate hat back on for a moment. I am right now uh, not going through the major terminals <laughs> of our airports, but I've been through them for 30 years. And in the last uh, year, it's just, it's so sad. It's actually, it's sad, it's depressing to see how someone who travels to America is welcomed uh, still and or uh, the ordeal they have to go through. 
uh, where you know you don't have free carts to be able to move your luggage, and if you're going to buy them, you haven't changed your money yet because the money change is on the other side of the thing. You, it's sort of it's not a system. So I pray that we're going to focus uh, more on that. And the tourism thing, we haven't begun to tap into what we could in terms of putting together our, our communities that do reenactments all across the country, schedules of reenactments, possibilities of bringing people here uh, for you know, certain periods of time. And these, I, I just think we could tap into that much more. We could do an infrastructure bank in America. I know this. The Chinese have told me they will invest in American infrastructure. The sovereign funds of the Emirates and of the Qatar and elsewhere, looking for a return on investment. If you did energy and transportation and water, all of which have a revenue stream, you could rebuild this country, put 20 million people to work. So I hope you all will make that a major objective of your efforts. And if I don't get over the White House, uh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Now, we're, we're not running out of airspeed and altitude yet, but we have a little bit of time pressure, but we want to hear from everybody. So, Secretary Fox, could you keep it rolling for us? Well, I have to say, uh, uh, Jim, uh, Secretary uh, Kerry could not have said it better. Uh, so it's great, uh, great to have not only a Secretary of State, but a Secretary of Transportation, too. Um, <laughs> Um, I want to applaud uh, the work of this, uh, this group, and uh, I want to say that the DOT stands ready to be supportive of the work of the, um, of the, uh, of the PEC. Um, I want to give a shout out also to Scott Davis. Um, I went on a tour recently of American infrastructure, and Scott was good enough to welcome me at the Louisville, Kentucky plant, which is about a 1.5 million square foot plant. Uh, goods, uh, freight moves in there, touches two human hands, moves through in 13 minutes a clip. But one of the things that Scott told me, which is emblematic of the challenge we face in infrastructure in America, is that across his system, a five minute delay results in a $100 million loss. Um, and that is my uh, transition to talking about some of the challenges and opportunities we have in American infrastructure right now. Um, since the last time we met, I, I mentioned then that we had formed a National Freight Advisory Committee, that we were using this committee, it's composed of 47 people from all around the country. Uh, we we're going to use that committee to develop a national strategic plan for freight, a critical part of, uh, of our infrastructure in this country. Um, and just parenthetically, we have about 50 freight programs in the country because each state kind of has its own thing. So we're trying to figure out how to link these, uh, these issues, cover gaps and relieve choke points. So we have a great group. They're working on a great plan. But the challenge we now face is that the Highway Trust Fund is going to run out of money as soon as August of this year. And um, we're about 10 years out from having a six-year reauthorization bill. Um, and the resources that we're putting in infrastructure, frankly, we're underinvesting. I think what Secretary Kerry said about airports is exactly true of also our surface transportation systems. And that's why um, the President and I have introduced the Grow America Act. It's a bill that's designed to change the conversation about transportation. And I'll just point out a couple of things that it does. Uh, the main thing it does is it puts $302 billion into infrastructure over the next four years, increasing it by $90 billion over that four-year period uh, beyond what the Highway Trust Fund would normally track. Uh, this is because we recognize that we have 14 billion tons of freight over and above what we're moving today that we'll need to move over the next 35 years, basically doubling the amount of freight. So if we're stuck with the same system, we're going to have more congestion, more choke points, and less ability to attract the jobs we're all talking about. Um, as part of this plan, we have a $10 billion allocation specifically targeted to implement this freight plan. Um, and the reality is, is that we'll have a great plan, a great group putting the plan together, but without reauthorization, without targeted resources, we're not going to be able to get that plan implemented. <coughs> so I, I come here really asking for your help 
in getting Congress to act on reauthorization and not just the funding piece, which is really important, but helping us with some of these policy pieces like freight that are going to be critical to the country long term. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You, you, the, uh, we spent yesterday at the BRT talking about infrastructure and getting behind political advocacy here. So we're, we're with you both here and there. So I appreciate your leadership here. Sure. Mike, did you want to have a comment? You've well, it's, uh, you've received so many nice comments today. Say it's, it's almost it's dangerous nice to, have, to say uh, something yourself. It's nice to have the president and the secretary of state be your warm-up act yeah. uh, <laughs> on your issues. So I, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. You know what our agenda is. Uh, it's TPP, TTIP, Information Technology Agreement, Trade and Services Agreement, Environmental Goods, AGOA, which the president talks about uh, doing more in Africa. We have GSP renewal. And of course, we have TPA. And many of these require congressional approval. We're working with our partners in Congress to try and build support for these to move them forward at the appropriate time. And I'll just say a word about TPP just to build on what the president said, because as he said, a lot of the debate around TPP is a debate about a trade policy that he explicitly distanced himself from and went beyond. It's about trade policy 25 years ago. You know, TPP is not your father's free trade agreement. This is a new type of trade agreement where instead of having labor and environment provisions as side agreements, afterthoughts, they're at the center of the agreement, they're stronger than ever before, they're more ambitious than ever before, and they're subject to binding dispute settlement. Now, that's what we're seeking in this negotiation. Same on IPR enforcement, strengthen IPR enforcement, even as we make sure we're striking the right balance between innovation and access, uh, access to medicines. For the first time ever, we'll have disciplines on state-owned enterprises. So that when they compete against private firms, they're, they're competing on a level playing field and not taking advantage of their subsidies in a way that put our firms at a disadvantage. And then as uh, to, to build on Ginny's comments and many others, this is, this is the first time we'll have a trade agreement that deals with the digital economy and bringing into the digital economy principles from the physical economy, like the free flow of data and a free and open internet. And so, uh, and then finally I'd say, very much front and center in all of our thoughts about TPP. In fact, it's the first trade agreement that will have a chapter specifically on this, are small and medium-sized businesses. Because we recognize that's where the real growth opportunity is, that's where the real uh, driving force of, of new jobs are. We got a lot of work to do to finish the agreements, and we have a lot of work to do to build support for them. Uh, we are appreciative of all the work that the business community has done to date. We're going to need a lot more of it going forward um, uh, to, to explain the benefits of trade, particularly to small and medium-sized uh, businesses as we take this campaign uh, forward, but there's a tremendous amount at stake, and I think the president alluded to this. These are as important strategically as they are economically, and there's really, it's, it's nothing less than a, uh, uh, an opportunity to set the rules of the road for this vitally important region in the Asia Pacific and then, and then with our European partners at a time when there are competing visions of what should govern the international trading system. And I can tell you, the competing vision is not one that's good for American workers or American intellectual property rights developers or for environmentalists or for people who care about a level playing field in the digital economy or SOEs. So there's a huge amount at stake here, and we're looking forward to working with all of you. We appreciate your advice and your support. We're looking forward to working with our partners in Congress to, to move this agenda forward. You know, Mike, I've, I'm not sure everyone realizes the size and the ambition involved with what you're doing. I mean, there has never been in our history a third of this level of engagement, if you measure GDP to GDP or the number of countries, not even close. So you need our support, and we'll be there for you. OK. Uh, Senator Klobuchar, did you have any additional comments you'd like to make? Just to say, uh, to thank, first of all, Penny uh, for her incredible work. I talked about the export control list last time, and I know there's been some advancements with that, and uh, really the whole team. Uh, our state's unemployment rate is down to 4.7%, uh, mostly all about exports uh, and, the, and what we are sending out of Minnesota. Um, to follow up on Secretary Kerry's comments for anyone's here, we are not asking for a visa waiver with Syria, I promise. Um, uh, but we are, we really do want to move, um, uh, continue to speed up the visa times for the countries uh, that we do trust and have good relationships with, as Arnie pointed out. 
uh, video conferencing, something that he supported when he was in the Senate, is something that we think we should experiment with. And uh, the last thing I just wanted to mention was uh, having been both in Canada and Mexico uh, lately, this whole uh, the president having met with the Prime Minister of Canada and the head of state of Mexico is this idea of this new day in America and working more with these two great trading partners and really seeing it as a regional force um, is something I think we need to develop at every level. Um, and they are both countries are so excited about this. And I just want to seize on this in terms of our infrastructure at the border that I already brought up, the Windsor Bridge fixing that guy, that troll that runs it with one <laughs> private citizen that's collecting all the money. The Canadians are really, they're willing to pay for the entire bridge and we have to get that thing done. Uh, it's a bottleneck. Um, and uh, I think we can learn from some of the things they've done with their infrastructure funding. And the last thing I wanted to mention, having spent my week uh, on the Medtronic issue, being the home of Medtronic, um, and knowing that this deal will actually bring a thousand new jobs to Minnesota, but at the same time very concerned about what this means to the future. I talked to Penny about it yesterday and uh, Jason that we need um, to get this tax reform going in a big way, and I'm not, I'm talking to the converted here, but yeah. um, because these incentives are in place. and. Um, uh, as we were talking about yesterday, we might not be able in Congress to make perfect the enemy of the good, and we have to find some way to create incentives to bring some of this money back uh, so we don't have to toast to my company with a Guinness uh, in Ireland. <laughs> so that is, uh, that's my hope as we go forward, because I do think it's going to have effect on everything we're talking about here uh, if we continue to have these kinds of deals go through. Well, all of us want to keep working with you in that spirit. Senator, thank you very much for your comments. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Gillibrand, do you have any additional things to say? I do. Um, yeah. I want to follow up on the conversation that Ginny started about the Internet and really what the global conversation is right now because I took a delegation from um, the Senate and the House to Asia this fall. And one of the issues we put on the agenda for each of our meetings, we were in South Korea, Japan, and China, was um, cyber because we thought the area of agreement could at least be creating international protocols to enforce cyber crime, uh, a set of standards internationally. Because obviously, if three guys in a basement in China are attacking the United States, we have to have some protocol to say, can you please go arrest them? Yeah. We don't have that today. But interestingly, when we were in China specifically, they see it as a national security priority that they get to steal our intellectual property, because these are government-owned, government-run businesses. So they converge spying with intellectual property and their right as a country who are investing in their businesses to steal our intellectual property. But when I challenged him on this issue of national security risk, he, he said his biggest national security risk in China are the blogs and how the blogs are criticizing him and the administration. So that is their view. And they see everything in the context of Snowden that you created the internet, you're the one who's stealing all our information, so we're gonna do what we need to protect. So this is a much bigger conversation that I want this council to look at. And specifically, for US businesses, Congress has not passed legislation on cybersecurity, which is a huge impediment, because a lot of companies are spending a lot of money to try to protect their infrastructure, and then a lot of companies are choosing not to, and the first time they hear about cybercrime or cyber intrusion is from the FBI, when they knock on their door and say, we've been tracking, you've been, you know, a billion dollars of your data has now been yeah. stolen, and you need to do something about it. So I'm working on legislation to create incentives for companies to make two levels of investment. Uh, first, to have a tax credit to do the baseline assessment. What are the protocols you have in place? Is it protecting your information? Is it safe? And the second thing we're uh, creating a credit for is, are you investing in hardware, labor, and software to create this flexibility to see ahead of the curve? So as an issue for our next meeting, I would love to have someone address the issue of cyber, the importance of uh, public-private partnerships, particularly with the U.S. government, to incentivize businesses to invest in it in a way that's positive to them. And if we create this incentive of baseline, it's not negative. The reason why Congress lost this debate last time is because they felt like they were being taxed. They felt like they were being asked to spend too much money. So if we can do it a positive reinforcement, giving tax credits, I think we can get not only the Chamber of Commerce, but the businesses around this table to be begin to look at cyber far more holistically yeah. because the w when we're dealing with trade, it is, it is all convoluted and that's why they're being so aggressive with these anti-competitive, anti-trade policies to control the internet in their countries. So I hope that we can do more um, collaboratively on how we get our businesses up to snuff on cyber 
uh, crime issues and then work together. And I just want to address the, the, the thing that Secretary Kerry um, mentioned on um, infrastructure. He was our leader on the infrastructure bank when he was a senator. And he wrote a very, very good bill, which sty was uh, stymied in the House and the Senate because it was a bank. So we are now working on an infrastructure authority, <laughs> <Financing> authority. <laughs> authority, which um, has two different, two different versions, one with financing and the other one um, with just streamlining. So when we were dealing with the financial collapse, one of the things we, the president did was streamlined how do you create um, infrastructure investments that don't take forever to get approvals for the environment and other things. So we're doing two versions of that. Both have bipartisan support. So we will work with um, industry and um, every state to try to get the political support we need for that. You know, I, I think your recommend that you laid it out perfectly on cyber. I think your recommendation we will take up. I think we, we had a letter on it three or four years ago. The issue is much bigger. It bumps up against economic growth exports, it bumps up against everything. Everything. everything it's now. national so, security, it's economic retaliation, and it's actually getting our own house in order, which we haven't even done. So we'll make sure the staff gets with your staff to make sure we're defining it the way you, you've laid it out perfectly. And so we'll we'll take it up and readdress, readdress the letter. Thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Reichert, any other comments? Uh, real quick. Sure. Uh, I've mentioned TPA, TPP, the importance of those. We're ready to yeah. work with you. I really wanted to reinforce the comments made uh, regarding XM Bank. Uh, I'm very supportive of the letter. There, as you know, uh, Ursula mentioned there there is huge um, um, <laughs> aversion to moving forward with that in Congress, especially on the House side. We really need your help. So please come up and visit those. As the President said, there are some enemies. Yeah. Those are the folks we need to visit. Uh, we're trying, but we need your help. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Congressman, and, and appreciate your leadership on the whole thing. Administrator Contreras, sweet. Did you, did you want to make an additional comment? Just, uh, just yeah. Briefly, uh, thank you. First, uh, thank you for um, engaging me in my first uh, meeting. Thank it's you very much. Great to have much. you here. Uh, to have but you here. mostly, I really want to thank the entire council for all the work that they've been doing on behalf of small businesses. You know, we don't want to hear more stories like Vanessa's, and, and lamentably, we've heard too many. And so, uh, so that's important work. Just understanding, as, as was said earlier, that the small business community is creating two out of three net new jobs, and that small businesses employ half of the private workforce is, is something that we have to take very seriously. And so I'm delighted by the efforts that have been undertaken here. I just wanted to say for the SBA's part, there's already been such extraordinary work done by my predecessor under this administration. And so I'm just delighted to be able to stand on, on the shoulders of that effort. But uh, moving forward as a banker, having started a community bank in, in Los Angeles, uh, dedicated to the underserved, where there were so many uh, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, women who were being underserved, I was delighted to be able to respond with the financial institution to address that. So I came in with that view, and, what, and as I mentioned earlier, it was so important for us to consider the technology that we can now deploy to make certain that banks do the smaller dollar loans that help spur economic activity that helps small businesses get started. And so we've just launched a program called Startup, and it goes all the way to scale up. And in between, we have the growth accelerators. We've just launched, I've just announced to, in Boston that we've just launched a program to identify 14 communities where we will invest to create growth accelerators, and, and we think that'll help uh, create innovation. For the counseling, you know, we, uh, SBA has one of the vast, a very impressive network of counseling centers throughout the country. And so I want to make certain, uh, again, the administration is committed to assuring that these programs are standardized and that there is no wrong door. Right now, the, the programs are really effective at making certain that the counseling goes uh, to the extent, you know, of SBA programming. But uh, the Secretary of Commerce and I have a website that we work on called uh, Business USA, and it's about no wrong door, so that when somebody goes to that website, they can reach all of the government departments. We think we need to bring that to life through our counseling centers. They should be able to consult on what's available through the Exim Bank, through the Ag Department, through DOE, DOT, DOD. And so we're, we're revamping the way we think about our counseling centers. And lastly, you all know that the United States is the largest procurer in the world, with 23% being dedicated to small businesses. And so that's a marvelous program. We've made great strides, and I think we're going to have some really good news about our progress in that regard. 
But what's important now is that we expand it so that small businesses can diversify their portfolio and also include private sector work. And so I was delighted that Jeff Zines took a great uh, amount of leadership in that regard to assure that we expand our American Supplier Initiative, which takes that concept and that program and that support to the private sector. So I look forward to working with you in that regard to continue to support our small businesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, appreciate your leadership and look forward to continuing to engage. Uh, Depsec Harden from AG. Yes, thank you. Welcome me. back. And, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, U.S. Um, ag exports are continuing to increase, and we're, we're on track for another record high this year, which is very good news. Um, but we're not resting on our laurels. Um, Secretary Vilsack is in Europe this week meeting with his counterparts um, regarding TTIP and some of the issues um, that <clears throat> we have with the Europeans, so we're hopeful there. We also had good news this week that Hong Kong is fully opening the market for um, our beef with no restrictions, so that's positive news. Um, and I'll just mention um, an initiative that the President announced when he signed the Farm Bill back in February um, called Made in, Amer Made in Rural America. So it's really a new initiative for rural businesses to engage for the first time in export markets. So we're very excited about that. The Secretary kicked that off this month in Pennsylvania, and I know other Cabinet members are going to be doing sessions um, around the country. Thank you very so much for you. your comments and, and, and welcome. Uh, Deputy Secretary Poneman. Do you have a comment from uh, from Energy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just three points. I know it's late. Yeah. Uh, point one to Senator Gillibrand's point. In the electric sector and our responsibility as a sector coordinating committee for the critical infrastructure of the country, we have quarterly meetings at the CEO level. We have worked with the uh, industry to provide risk maturity models so they know the nature of the risk. We are providing informational sharing tools. So not only are we uh, very happy to work with the Senator, but with uh, the President's Export Council because there's a huge uh, risk. Obviously, we're realizing already, but there's also huge opportunities and there's good work going on, and I think we can work with you on that. Second point, uh, to echo uh, Secretary Kerry, we go all around the world. I've recently uh, been in Argentina, in Chile, and Mozambique, and people are very eager to work with us uh, across a whole range of energy uh, sector opportunities. And our companies, to mention just two PEC members, uh, AES and Andres Gluski yeah. uh, down in Chile and in uh, Argentina with the uh, gas opportunities, Andrew Liveris. Uh, these are tremendous game-changing uh, energy opportunities for American business. We need to and we can partner well. Our job is to come in and try to keep the transparency, the contract sanctity, uh, the rules of the road clear. Uh, and I think that's working. Our role is also to make sure that when they develop these resources, they do so in a prudent and a sustainable way so we can keep the public support for it uh, across the board. Uh, and um, the initiative the President drove with Power uh, Africa uh, and Secretary Moniz going there to lead the uh, Energy Ministerial Secretary Pritzker down there recently, uh, that's, that's a real game changer. Third point, uh, the initiative that Secretary Pritzker mentioned uh, on the uh, innovation uh, hubs. Uh, this has been uh, already a game changer. The additive manufacturing, which you're already seeing uh, the beginning of the good results uh, there, the, uh, and you know this very well, sir, the uh, uh, upcoming uh, solicitation for advanced composite materials yeah. to lightweight vehicles, both aircraft and, uh, and ground transportation, uh, possibility of using that to make CNG tanks. So the uh, applications for CNG on our transportation fleet uh, also potentially game changer. And then, of course, the uh, power electronics that pervade our entire economy. Uh, also, 60% uh, of power ends up going through motors, and if you could lightweight those, and if you can get the hotter, faster, uh, more powerful electronics uh, there, these are those early stage investments, and as you said, we don't know exactly which ones are going to pay off, uh, but when they do, uh, it can be incredible. Mm -hmm. And I would just close by noting, we, we invested $137 million back in the 70s and 80s in strange technologies having to do with horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, and that is what is behind the tremendous uh, bow wave of, of natural gas we've seen to this day. So uh, we're, we're ready to work with all of your members. Well, thank you very much, and there's some exciting stuff there and important work, so appreciate it. Caroline, did you want to make a quick comment? Yeah. 
Just very quickly, again, three points. First of all, building off what Dan says, and I'm the president's international economic advisor, Sherpa in the G20 and G7. So um, I take everybody's agendas and try to sell them uh, in, that, in those groups, uh, including yours, which I'm interested to hear. Uh, building off from Dan, climate, and I'm not sure if you've been able to discuss that today, but that is an extremely important issue for the president. It's also an issue where I think mistakenly people have seen it as contrary to business interests. But as Dan said, we can be the leaders. We are the leaders in technology and clean energy. And that is uh, there's increasing acceptance of the need to adopt those sorts of uh, solutions worldwide. And it is a real growth area for the United States. My second point is a tough one, which you discussed a bit this morning. Um, part of the reason I've been in and out is uh, because of the situation in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, I know that uh, no business uh, in the United States likes to hear about uh, sanctions, but I want to assure you that we are really listening and want to hear from any of you about how best we can work on that front. Uh, and one clear message has been uh, for several months, we need to work with partners, we need to be close with them, and that is what uh, we, are, we are working to do all the time. Uh, and then finally, just on a broader level, uh, I can say that the debate in the G20 has really shifted. Secretary Kerry referred to the president's leadership on issues to do with growth and job creation and financial sector reform. Those were hard and difficult issues to get agreement on. But for the last uh, year or so, and especially this year in the G20, there is agreement that the main goal for all of us around there and for the leaders is to promote growth and jobs. And for us, that also means other countries opening up their markets for, uh, for a more balanced growth worldwide. Thank you. Well, thank you. And Caroline, I, I, I can, uh, we said it over breakfast, but uh, the administration's willingness to engage when geopolitics bump up against commercial interests has been extraordinary. Jeff and you and others have and we highly appreciate that, and we know it's tricky and hard, so we, we get it. Um, I think that Ursula or, or Secretary Prisker, any additional comments? I would just comment that our next meeting is scheduled Thursday, September 18th. Now, Ursula's mission, I think, leaves around the 20, Poland, Turkey, maybe Ukraine, around the 28th, 28th. 28th of uh, Still time to sign up. Sign up. Yep. Yeah. And uh, sign up. So um, send recommendations and suggestions. Do not drop out if you're already signed in. She, she will call you. Thank you. Meetings adjourned.